you back on the show? Me? Yeah, since last time we did. I was supposed to do Dragon Con. Yeah, and yeah. finish it off. Okay, we'll start this bad boy. Okay. So welcome to the latest episode of Galfrey Pirate Radio, where we are coming at you live from GnomeCon 2015. I am your host, Diego Beauchamp, and I am joined by Trisha Lightfoot. Trish. And you oh, talk about yourself a little. I keep talking about myself. Um That's why I like making you do it. Because he's evil. I am evil. Um, I actually am on the board for GnomeCon this year, so y'all are stuck with me. And uh, I'm from Savannah. Well, no, I'm not from Savannah. I'm currently living in Savannah, and I don't know what you want me to say. Well, you know, you know the KT track. And all oh, oh yes. Oh my God, I'm not doing my. I'm not doing my. Um, my. Yeah, uh, what's your Hit me. I know. Jill would hit me. Um, I work with the kaleidoscope track. I've done Dragon Con as well, and we do be we love nine you. to fourteen year olds. I'm sorry, Jill. I should have just started with that. Um, <laughs> And uh, we work with the 9 to 14 year olds and all their shows, Nickelodeon, um, Cartoon Network. We're doing some retro stuff. Uh, there's going to be a reboot of School of Rock this year, so we're going to cover that. Really? Yep. Old and new. That's going to be our, our, our retro thing this year, School of Rock. Cool. Wait, School of Rock is in. Um, not, 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 not Jack Black. Jack Black School of Rock? Oh, that's exciting. Oh, I think there's going to be a TV show. I'm sorry, not a reboot. Okay, that's awesome. I think there's going to be a TV show. Yeah, we're totally nice. So that's going to be our retro <laughs> this year. All excited. Okay. Awesome. Um, I am Maya Freisler. Um, I make art and create <laughs> very things. Um, cool t-shirts. I'm the creative mastermind, uh, mastermind behind Trickster's Apparel. And um, make some cool TARDIS art that you can find downstairs. And Tech Monkey for GPR. Oh yeah, and I'm now the Tech Fairy. Oh, can you use Tech Fairy? She handles all the uh, great um, slideshows that I make for <laughs> for Dr. Trivia and any other trivia I make. Okay, so talking seriously, it's probably the most controversial season so far of Dr. Who, for various reasons. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't know. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, that'll, in case it gets loud. Yeah, and they can, you know, poke their heads in if they want to get yeah. in. Yep. Yeah. Maybe if we shut the door, more people will yeah. be like, oh, it's like, session, oh, what's your name? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So, yeah, this is uh, considered a very controversial season of Doctor Who. Um, but what you think of Series 8, before I bring up the controversy and stuff like that? I liked it. Um, but uh, like I was telling you earlier, I just mainlined it. I I never got caught up on it, so I sat down one day when it was all on on demand on on the cable and watched it. I think if not in one day, in like a day and a couple hours. You know? <laughs> it's only twelve episodes, so. And then I ended with the uh, the yeah. holiday Christmas special, the Christmas special, the last Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, which was a little weird, and it took me halfway through the episode to realize that that was um, the guy from Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, Nick Frost. Yes. I was like, oh, that's it's not, oh, that's his friend. Okay. Yes. Um, I liked it. I think it was kind of up and down. I almost felt like in the beginning it was more like they were still writing for Matt Smith. It was a little bit more, it, it sounded, it was more like they kind of found his voice kind of as they were going through it, and I really liked the way they were portraying him at the end. Your turn. Your turn. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with your statement about some of it being written for Matt Smith, like um, the Robin Hood episode. Mm -hmm. uh, so, 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 it's it's like if you could just take out Capaldi and stick in Matt Smith, it would be so perfect. Um, but there was a lot of really great episodes, like Time Heist. I. I love. I think it would be one of my, my favorites so far. And remind me, because I'm so horrible at ever knowing the title. The Bank Breaking. Oh, okay, yep. The oh, Absalom no. Dax, yeah. the Dialect Killer. Yeah, I, I okay. loved that one. Yeah. I liked it. Okay, okay so, you, you, so you liked it. So a lot of people um, have issue with, um, let's start with Clara. How do, you, how do you feel about Clara this season of 
in uh, in Series A. Because a lot of people were like ready to see her go halfway through the season. They're ready to see her go at the end of the Christmas special. You, you played my more. Um, how how do you feel about Clara? And do you want to see her go? I don't necessarily want to see her go, but I would like them, I don't know, I'm getting, and it's not just her, but it's in all of the companions, I'm getting tired of them writing the companion like they're in a dysfunctional relationship. It's like, I, I'm, I'm addicted to like the travel, I can't like stop lying to people or, you know, it, it doesn't always go that way, but it's like, you know, they did that with Rory and, um, shoot, thank you, it's been a long day. It has. Um, Rory and Amy were just like, hey, I run off the night before my wedding and I don't tell him and then I'm still keeping secrets and yada yada and then now we're back to that where it's like, okay, well, you know, kind of lying to Danny and oh, I'm not going to go to any more of these adventures and then immediately running right back out the door. And, yeah. Oh, come on, those were two, she had two very healthy relationships, one with the doctor, one with Danny. I mean, the, the, they are the <laughs> picture of healthy relationships. Uh, I was going to say. <laughs> Sarcasm alert. Yeah, yeah, that was sarcasm. <laughs> but do you think they were doing that on purpose? Because she actively sought out two very yeah. bad relationships. I mean, she really did. If you really look at it, you know, she had a horrible relationship with Danny. She had a horrible relationship with the doctor that was filled with lies on both sides. But you think that was on purpose? Um, a teaching moment of some sort that would come down the line? Well, if they were going to use it as a teaching moment, I would have hoped that it would have clarified by the end of the season. Usually, if you're going to... I have to go outside of Doctor here for this. Yeah. This is... I had... I love Dennis Leary. I mm -hmm. loved that um, show that he did where he was the firefighter. Rescue, Rescue me. me. But he... Every season, it was like he was almost learning the lesson going right back to the beginning. Going Almost learning the lesson going right back to the beginning. And it's like, well, you either have to learn the lesson or you don't. You know? But it, if it takes too long for the payoff, you just kind of were like, okay, I'm with the character. And then stop watching the series. I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, after, <laughs> I, I got halfway through season two and I was like, and he's yeah, still yeah, doing yeah, it. Okay, yeah, bye. I loved it. It's scary, but yeah. Yeah. Just check. I don't know. So um, and so, even if it was meant to be a teaching thing, I think they're taking too long for the payoff and it's, I've lost interest. So, I don't necessarily care if she, I mean, I don't want her to leave necessarily, but if they, she comes back, we need to do something. So what do you think of, of, about uh, Miss Clara? Do you want to see her go? Do you want to see her stay? I love Clara. That being said, I really, as an actress, Jenna Coleman showed some amazing diversity and just incredible acting chops this season. That having been said, I feel like they reduced her from this amazing person who was the only person in the universe who had the capacity to save the doctor. She was the impossible girl to the dysfunctional relationship. And furthermore from that, the the Juliet in our let's let's rip everybody's hearts out and make them cry and everybody know the true love doesn't win in the end. Like I I yeah. Really don't love that they did that to her <laughs> and just just that whole thing. Yes. But then again, with you saying that, this is Stephen Moffat. He's not willing to just, you know, leave a story on a cliffhanger. You know, I mean, he's willing to leave a story on a cliffhanger, but then resolve it, you know, three seasons down the, and, down and the line. And Danny somehow magically comes back, and we have an explanation for, like, the grandson in the future who has the little army guy and the story about his time traveling family and that's all explained and fine okay fine but honestly it felt like she became reduced to an emotional gimmick a way for us to we didn't have any emotional connection to the doctor mm -hmm. so we had to both us and Missy interacted with the doctor emotionally through Clara she became a proxy and she, I didn't really like Is she that. a proxy or is she a pawn? In that particular episode, she was a pawn. Although, in leading up into it, I would say that she was a proxy because certainly, at least more than any other companion in the modern era, she spent a significant part of this season pretending to be the Doctor. And or claiming that she was. And, and that made me feel like she was a proxy, both for the audience and for the other characters. 
because one of the nice things about the companions is that you always had to have them on the show, not necessarily, I mean, especially going back to the first run, they were there to kind of like humanize the doctor. Like they were the ones that were interacting with them. They were the ones who were giving you like how you should see this and what's going on. But there was you know, not necessarily, not in the same way. I mean, the way that it was this season, it was like you could add a doorstop to it. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I she was such a brilliant character. I felt like they sold her short. Okay, since we brought up the subject of Danny, um. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you feel about how they treated Danny in this season? Because a lot of people have had issues with that as well. Well, and then that one, it, like, see, this is where I always run into weird stuff because I wasn't watching it as it came out. But yeah. I was playing Doctor Who, that the game thing with it, and Danny Pink showed up. Oh, I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> the, tiny Rebel, the Tiny Rebel games? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The phone app. So I was playing the phone app, and all of a sudden you had this guy come up named Danny Pink, and I was like, who is this? So I was like, that actually was kind of one of the things where I was like, I want to see this now, because it's the character. Um, I don't know. In some ways, it's like, in a lot of ways, it was like he was there just to be the the spur for whatever emotion was supposed to be there. Should you feel like Clara is being like the dysfunctional relationship and shouldn't be lying and doing all this, it was his reaction. They didn't use the doctor, it was like, okay. And then should we be thinking that, you know, love never triumphs or other things are going on, you use him to get the emotional reaction. It was almost, I don't know, it was almost more like he was there to spur what we were supposed to be feeling in some ways. But on the other hand, I mean, I liked him. I wish she could have developed him more. I really did like it. What about you? I, as much as I loved his character and felt like they could have developed him more, honestly, I felt like he was Rory 2.0. Mm, yeah. And Rory was great. I love Rory, but it's it's the same problem with Martha, of Martha being Rose 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, you had your chance to tell these character stories and they're over, they're done with, and I understand that those emotional and plot devices work for you and work for the audience, but it's not fair to the characters to not let them be their full selves. So what do you think about the fate of Danny? Cyber Danny. Um, I was watching all those episodes, and it was like, wait, now there's future, now there's this, now this, and then he didn't come back, and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> simply them turning him into a Cyberman, mm, having yeah. him sacrifice himself, and then sacrifice himself yet again to bring back a boy whose parents may not even be alive still. Yeah. And who's dead now? Well, time now? Yeah, well, I mean, on one hand, you know, that was kind of how they were portraying him through the season, or what little bits of background you got was that he would be that kind of person. That it was, I would take somebody like a kid and give them that chance, even if I wasn't sure it was going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, I figured that that was what he would do because that was kind of how they portrayed him through what you got through the whole season. So, the Cyberman thing was weird. It was like Cyberman, and he has feelings, and this, and I was like, well, why? Uh, I didn't really particularly really like that part. So Cyber Danny, how did you feel about Cyber Danny and Danny King's fate? Um, wow. Okay, it, uh, <laughs> it bothered me because we saw Orson in the future. Um, so, so problematic. There's that whole, in theory, he's got some descendant who looks nearly identical to him, has his childhood toy that's been passed down, includes his family, or time travelers, so Clara needs to be pregnant. Just, and she might come back next season, it is. We don't know. Maybe. Legitimately. Um, to, to be, um, For all the characters to get turned into Cybermen and resist the programming, as 
especially because they tacked the premier at the end of the episode. I, I didn't feel like that role was written for Danny. I felt like he was just kind of stuck in there. I felt like he was an emotional device, like she said, to use to manipulate people. And it also bothered me because there was so much of that dialogue in his conversations with Clara about, you know, everybody always talks about the people that I've killed, not the wells that I've dug, and, you know, the doctor always calling him P.E., and so he's being devalued the whole... Thank you. He's being devalued the whole time, and he's always arguing, I'm a good man, I'm worth more than this. And then in the end, he makes this amazing sacrifice, and the doctor still kind of calls him P.E., and it's like, well... The character, even in his death, was not able to transcend that stereotype of a soldier, and that really bothered me. I disagree. I think he called him P.E. in that very last scene just because he was... He thought that Danny had figured the way to come back, and it was just his way of ribbing him to... Oh my god, to <laughs> Clara, because he wanted Clara to be with Danny. That might be the case, but it, it, the writer in me felt like here's this character who's made a beautiful sacrifice, and it's totally legitimate to have characters make those sort of beautiful sacrifices, but the point of your character making that sacrifice is that both your audience and the other characters should be deeply impacted by it. It should be life-changing. and. I saw it really impact Clara, but I I don't know that it impacted anybody else. And maybe if, if it comes back and it has emotional impact on the doctor, it will seem like it was worth it. But right now, do you think maybe it's because he might have been, I'm trying to get my thought to work here, the doctor might have been in some ways jealous because of even all the stuff that's going on, Danny always asserted he was a good person. And that's been the doctor's whole thing this season was, am I a good man? He can't even have confidence in it. And here's this guy that he doesn't really, he's like, you know, you're a soldier. I don't like that. I don't trust that. But he, he knows deep down he's a, good, he's a good man. But I think he did have the confidence because remember he said, you know, he figured out how to come back. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he had that faith in Danny where he was not going to have to tell Danny how to come back. He gave him the means and Danny figured it That's out. That's true. But I mean, in, there was just a lot in this series where I felt like we were going back to stuff we'd done before. I mean, they had the whole thing with going into the Dalek and, you know, oh, you make a good Dalek again. It's like, you know, you, you were great. You have all this hate. You do all this stuff. Well, we did that in the first season. Does he learn any lessons? <laughs> okay. Um, Which, yeah, granted, he's oh, very, uh, very old, and if he hasn't learned them by now, he probably won't. But. Well, I was, was, was going to address this. I was going to ask this question later, but... Um, I think the reason why we actually went back and explored some of these same topics was we've never had a regeneration like this, mm -hmm. where the Time Lords have reinstilled a whole new set of regenerations. Um, this is the first time this has actually happened that we know of, except to maybe uh, Rassilon. And I can explain why Rassilon went off the deep end with the whole Time War. But I honestly, I think this entire season, from the very first episode until he gives the I'm an idiot speech, he is still cooking. He's still suffering from regeneration sickness this entire season, and he really doesn't know who he is. That's why we have the funny moments. That's why we have the ups, we have the downs. And that's why I was so excited about the Christmas special, because it was the first time I felt that we got a fully cooked doctor. We kind of got an insight of how Capaldi is going to play him from here on out. Uh, so I gave, I, I'm giving them a lot of latitude with this season, depending on what they do in the next. And am I trying to like retrocon or like try to make everything fit? I just, I really think that is what they were thinking, that this is a chance to show a really traumatic regeneration for the Doctor, because there have been very few time lords that have gotten this sort of, this gift. Well, then, I would have to go back, I wish they had written it better, if that was what they were intending, because what it really felt like to me was like that first season of Star Trek The Next Generation, where it was like, oh god, are we going to do another thing that they kind of did in the past? Mm. It, it, it wasn't clear enough, it just felt like re rehashing. Okay. I mean, overall, I did love yeah. the series, the, 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 the eight. It, was, yeah. it had some great, great moments. I mean, I really liked that one where he was asking Clara, it's like, yeah, I'm a good man. Yeah. That was very, very powerful. Be a pal, Clara, and tell me, am I a good man? 
I'm um, still not sure what to think about Robin Hood, but that's okay. <laughs> but, yeah. I was like, but okay, you brought up you brought up another really controversial part when you mentioned cider break. How do you feel about them bringing back the breed here, but as a cyberman? I mean, because I mean, for a lot of old school people, it, it had a much greater impact yeah. than, let's say, the new generation of graphic viewers, because they don't have this sentimental attachment they don't have to the sentimental attachment. But in, it kind of goes back to what she was saying. It's it's with Danny being shoved into that role, if there was somebody who was going to get resurrected as a Cyberman and he was going to still keep his brain and his emotions and he was going to still be mm -hmm. a soldier, mm -hmm. that was him. Yeah. So that was like a good moment for him. Yeah. I like that. Any feelings, special feelings about uh, Cyberbreak? And I just finally realized the same break, not break. Break. Yeah. Um, I, I, feel like, I feel like they sold him short too because if anybody was going to have that whole love is a promise, that whole dialogue, that should have been the break with his daughter. Yeah, like, I feel like they kind of broke one role into two pieces. Yeah, it, it felt it felt very much like that should have been one character and I, I think that as much as turning the Brigadier into a Cyberman really destroyed everything that he stood for, <coughs> in my opinion. No, I, I, I can't argue but, that. Um, if he had had Danny's role, if he had been the commander in the end, who, it would have been this beautiful tribute to the character. Yeah. Instead, he hangs back, he waits for all the other Cybermen to do the dirty work, lets another man sacrifice himself, That's a man true. of the future, just so that he can stand and get a, a nod from the doctor. <laughs> what a jerk. I sense there's some passion about this. <laughs> <laughs> I, come, I come from a, a military family. No, so I, I, I have very strong <laughs> feelings about the way that like, military men behave, and that is not, that's not the way the brigadier should behave. Mm -hmm. That's disingenuous for that sort of military man to stand by yeah. and let a junior officer make the sacrifice like that. It would have been nice if they had just, I mean, there's always a big divide between the people who watch Old Who and New Who, but when you, sometimes when you reintroduce new characters, they've done a much better job with it in giving like the background and all that. I mean, they kind of, kind of felt like they just expected, you know, who the Brigadier is. I mean, I know that we've talked about him and that's his daughter and this and that, but it's like, you, unless you watched some of those episodes, you just didn't really yeah. get it. I mean, Sarah Jane had a much better... Was like, and that was a little flawed because it was well, suddenly like, I was in love with the doctor the whole yeah, time. That yeah. really bothered I, me. I didn't like that. No. I didn't like that, but it was like getting more of like some of this. I didn't want it to be love, but it was the fact that that I believed, and that was something I would have. The whole thing where she was like, You left me behind. I didn't know where oh, going. That yeah, part. Yeah. Not the arguments with like no. Rose. But, but it was seeing like, the life of a companion after the doctor has left yeah. and the emotional impact. Yes, the emotional impact. impact and, you know, we, we went to. Because I always forget about that part. Because I just remember the old part. But it's the whole thing about, you know, you, you left me to go to Gallifrey or whatever, and you just never came back. See, what was I supposed to do? I just had to and start that's living so, my life. And that's such a horrible mistake in that dialogue because. She did see him again in the Five Doctors. Uh, yeah, it, it was it was the anniversary for the fifteenth or fifteen. No, no, it was either fifteen or twenty, where they brought all the living doctors that were willing to come back to the show to come back to the show and stuff like that. And Sarah Jane was in there, oh. so it, in a way that that was the yeah, they, they, had, yeah they, they kind of messed <laughs> that up. But you know, yeah, I always had issues with that. But let's talk about the most controversial. Let's talk about the controversial death. And I'm not talking about Danny, I'm talking about Osgood. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about Osgood dying? Because I'll tell you, fans were not happy with that death at all. But I think it served a really good purpose. It served its purpose that needed to be served. Which was? To show that <laughs> Missy Sasa Master <laughs> was happened. actually a threat. Mm -hmm. That she would kill somebody. And not just, you know, a red shirt or, you know, green shirt for the military or, you know, it, she had to impose a real threat. How do you feel about the demise of Osgood, the Doctor Who fan of the show? I... It's hard because even going back and watching him and I appreciate this, like, the scarf and the character and all that, but what purpose did she have on the show? 
and it just never really, I, it's like I know I saw her in the one, and then you know you didn't see her for a while, but it just like I almost like totally forgot she was in there. Really, that's yeah. interesting. And it's weird. So and then when she came back, I was like, oh yeah, her and the brigadier's daughter. Okay. And that could also be the fault of how I end up having to watch it because I can't see it as it comes out, and then I end up watching it all in one chunk, which is probably not great for retention. <laughs> Until I get the season later and I can watch it again, but I, I just. I didn't honestly know, like, she kind of seemed like a red shirt, even though it was like a, a cool character. Because a lot of people had hoped that she was going to be with the new companions. Because mm -hmm. at this point, we knew that we were going to be getting some new companions next season. And when he made that comment about all, all, uh, all time and space, mm -hmm. you know. Something Yeah. And then does it just, I mean, it also just seems like such a trope that it's like, you know, the, the nerdy scientist girl with the glasses and the asthma, and she's the one who dies. <laughs> so how do you feel about that? That's good stuff. Um, I, I legitimately cried. Um, that, that really upset me, because um, I had grown a little attached to her. But it... <laughs> <laughs> I reiterate, it's been a long day. Uh, it bothered me for a couple of reasons. One being that she she had almost sort of become that stereotypical trope at that point of the nerdy fan girl with asthma, um, and it was so sad for me to see the intelligent way that she handled herself and got away from the Zygons. Mm -hmm. The intelligent way that she handled herself when they when Unit was storming in the square. And then for her to underestimate Missy and die so sort of casually and meaninglessly, it was like, really? Really? She's gonna, she's, I mean, because if she's a fan of the Doctor, she should theoretically have some sort of clue of who his arch nemesis is and maybe take them seriously. But more to the point, she is the personification of all of us as fans. And particularly in a, in a place where Moffat is being accused of being sexist, and there's a lot of us female fans coming to his defense and being like, no, no, he's actually a really great writer. Maybe it's just coincidental that she's a girl who was killed off, but I'm like, dude, how about a little loyalty? We're the ones on your back here. Um, and you could kind of take it a couple different ways, because it's not just the girl aspect, but, you know, he's the fan, and she's, she's the fan. She's a fan? So, so it's you, like you're, you're killing, killing all the fans? Like, there are so many, as the personification of all of us, that it's problematic for me in a couple different ways, uh, the way that she was killed. And again, it seemed like, here's somebody you care about, how do we make Missy evil? Let's help her kill her. Yeah. <laughs> really? Really? I miss the old master. Oh. <laughs> so, speaking of Missy's <laughs> last semester, how do you feel about the uh, the new master? And yes, I will call her uh, master before Missy or anything else, because to me, she is playing the master. And I'm okay with the, there being a woman master. I'm okay with her being a woman master, but if and I have to I have to say that I, I understood that I understand that there can be um, like rights issues because I know that they were talking to um, the actresses or the actress and her family for the audiobooks that played the Ronnie just before she died. So I don't know that anything had been signed or if they have the rights to use. Had, there was some sort of legal thing. Oh, no, no, it. everything with the Ronnie Swan because okay. they finished audio actually they brought her back. Oh, yeah, 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 it's all okay. fine. They we're talking about there was something, I don't know if it was with that or whatever, but if you're going to have a female bad guy who's an evil scientist basically taking these people in and putting them into machines and creating Cybermen, why are you using the master? That's the Ronnie. I mean, there was yeah. more to it, but if that was how you were going to portray, portray it? Well, yes and no, because the Master and the Cybermen do have a long-running relationship. Yeah, um, but I mean, it was just the way that they were doing it, where it was all done from the scientific angle, and it was the putting the brains into the, this other world, and interacting with you know, the cyber world, and interacting with them and everything. It just really came across more like the evil scientist. 
I, I didn't have, and I don't have any problem. I don't care, you know, they're Gallifrans. However, they regenerate. It's you figure sometimes it's going to be female, male, whatever. Except it'll never be the doctor because the fans, you know. But, but I mean, if you were going to, I don't know, if you were going to do it, I would just, you know, it was just unclear for me because it really did come across more. I, I know that there's the Cyberman angle, but it really did feel more like, you know, you were fighting the evil scientist. And for me, there already was a character for that. Valid one. So how did you feel about the sea, the slash, the master? Conceptually, I, I like the idea that we've, we're now seeing them regenerate in different sexes, possibly. Um, but... Her portrayal of the master, and, and this is what makes it more real, seemed less like an actual woman who was being man manipulative and more like a boy who'd gotten in a female body for the first time and was like, oh my god, what are these? <laughs> I, it, she, she seemed so focused on kissing the doctor and manipulating the doctor and playing head games with him and then her little whole conversation with Osgood and it was just so... Brilliant. No. 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 <laughs> like, there there like are the absolutely the evil and manipulative female characters in the world of fiction that just... I mean, Cersei Lannister. To, to jump to another fandom, like, we never do that. God, you love to hate her. But she is what she is through and through, and you understand why she does the way that she does. Missy seemed like she was all over the place. Mm -hmm. What did, did she want the doctor to tell her that he loved her? Did she want him to say he win? Did she, like, it, it reduced, one of my friends joked a while back on Facebook, Yes, Dayton, this is for you. Um, that the master acts like the doctor's psycho ex. And I was like, well, yeah, okay, I can kind of see that. Until I saw Missy, and then I was like, okay, yeah. yeah if really if the master the doctor's psycho ex-girlfriend who just won't leave him alone, then Missy did a brilliant job at doing that. If that is not what the, mister, the master is, then I'm kind of disappointed because there's so much more intelligent and masterful ways to be manipulative that don't involve running around kissing people. Okay, the, I think you have to look at the history of the master here um, when, when you're talking about this because I think a lot of people don't realize the master is something a little different than any other time lord. Um, he does have a past with the doctor of some sort. We don't know exactly what it is. Um, and. Mm -hmm. He's the only Time Lord that we know of that is capable of stealing another person's body and taking over their form because he's out of regenerations. Um, and so we don't actually know what the effects of that are. And we do know at one point he was executed and turned to a gel-like snake by the dialects. And that's where we get the Eric Roberts Snake Master before he takes over that body. And we don't know what happened to him during Time War. We don't know how he got more regenerations, because he clearly regenerated from the, the nice, kindly old doctor, or, the, or professor that he didn't know who he was, into the John Sims insane master. So, and then we don't know what happened to John, the John Sims master uh, on Gallifrey with uh, Rassilon and everything else. Um, we don't know what's happened to this guy. And here's the thing is, we don't know who he exactly took over. What happens if, you know, the master decided to take over Romana's body? And that would explain a lot of things. Like, he stole Ramona's body, took her regenerations, and that could explain a lot of the psychoness that he had for the Doctor and with the Doctor, especially since even in the Baker era, back when we had Ramona the first time, you know, there were some hints that maybe there's a little hanky panky going on in the TARDIS between the two of them. So, what have, you know, <laughs> we don't know what the effects of his type of regeneration, his taking over bodies, does to him. I mean, I'm, not, I'm just, you know, sort of playing a little bit of devil's advocate there with, with the master and stuff. And it's always good to play the devil's advocate, but then... They, well, I'm looking they, at it differently. The, 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 yeah. You know, there's looking at the different things, yeah. but then what... And this might be part of the problem, is what the writing crew needs to look at. 
is that there are some of us who have watched a lot of it, including yeah. the old stuff, but there's a lot of people who haven't. Mm -hmm. So you can't get too wrapped up in like stuff that would be too subtle for the newer viewers to, to be able to figure and out. And I agree, because right now we do know that like what the reason why we haven't gotten the Ronnie is Big Finish is getting the user right now. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't have Ramona right now is because Juliet Landu, who played uh, Drusilla mm -hmm. on Buffy, is doing the next incarnation of Romana in the audience. Nice. Um, which would actually be really cool to actually, get, I think you can actually bring her to the show as oh, that yeah. same character. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that's the reason why I do play a little devil's advocate there with that sort of thing. And unfortunately, unlike here in the States where on a show, you do have a writing team and one person gets to put their name on it as head writer. Mm -hmm. Over in England, it mm -hmm. is pretty much Moffat hiring out the scripts and him tweaking stuff. So it's not like it is here. It's definitely a much smaller people yeah. that touch stuff. Yeah, and, and as sad as it is, I think sometimes that is like one of the biggest issues that ever comes up if a real fan ever gets to write mm -hmm. for a show is because you'll get a lot of subtleties that your general viewership won't get. Yeah. Because I mean, honestly, if you look at Night of the Doctor, where you know they bring McGon back finally, and you get a lot of fan service in that thing. In, in those short eight minutes, McGon or I mean, Moffat basically canonizes all the big Finnish audio mm -hmm. in one fell swoop, where he names all the companions and stuff like that from Big Finish. Um, but yeah, since we're actually on the topic of the writers and stuff like that, and the showrunner, <laughs> is it time for Moffat to go? Because that's been another big point of contest. I don't know. I mean, I've had, I have a friend, uh, Liv, or yeah. Liv, um, Liz. Sorry, I have two people yeah. with two names. Hi, Liz. Um, she's been saying for like three years, kick him out. You know, she's, she's like, nope, he's done, he's over, I hate it. Yeah, and I'm like, ooh. Um, I don't know, it gets rough because it's kind of like, uh, I'm going to skip stuff again, X-Men, mm -hmm. Chris Claremont. Yeah. That man, when he was on, he was he on. Was, oh, no shit. And I mean, he wrote some things where I was just like, oh. Yeah. And then when he wasn't. It was bad. It was horrible. And he did it for too long. Yeah. And so it was like the, the so even like in this, even in this season where right. it was like, hey, I got some moments where I was just like, oh, no, no, but it was like, they feel like they're getting further and further apart. What about you? Before I rebuttal with what the British are saying. I, I feel like I'm if Moffat's <laughs> if Moffat's heart and soul entirely were back in who, I would be content for him to stay on for however long he could keep that. But as an artist and a writer, I feel like to me, I can feel that Moffat is torn. He has other things mm -hmm. that he's, he's really focused on. And it's cool, I get that. I've got a lot of projects like that. <laughs> but the showrunner needs to be somebody whose heart and soul is in it. And I can tell the difference between when his heart and soul was so wrapped up in it and now that it's not. And so if we could have the old Moffat back, whose focus was entirely on who, yes, brilliant, stay forever. Um, but if you want to be free to work on other creative projects, maybe let somebody else have a shot. Okay, this is this is this is the whole whole British life thing. So I find it absolutely fascinating because it's it it's almost the polar opposite of, of what a lot of Americans are saying. Um, one thing Moffat said he would sooner you know you're going to have to pull uh, Dr. Who from his cold dead hands because um, <laughs> in his mind he loves it. Some people, especially here in the states, think that he's a better episode writer than a showrunner. Because if you look at back when he was writing for uh, Dav Davies, every episode that won awards were Moffat's episodes. Mm -hmm. um, the only other real show that he's doing right now is Sherlock. Mm -hmm. um, but over in is so long in between. Yeah. <laughs> um, the interesting thing is, is the Brits, you know, they waver on Doctor Who quite a bit, and they didn't care a lot for Series Seven mm -hmm. and some of the other stuff. But they have absolutely re-embraced this show like they have mm -hmm. never embraced it since almost its inception. They loved Series 8. Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of the critics, I mean, yeah, because you, you, you all have your like, oh, we don't like this, we don't like this out of any any fandom in your area. But on the whole, the Brits have loved the Capaldi season. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just like, it, it's reinvigorated them. And some people say it's because they tried to go for a more classic feel with some of the episodes, which I think they did at times. I think at times they didn't succeed. I mean, I had I had a lot of issues myself with some episodes. But I think one thing that Drew and I were always saying they were consistently good. I mean, and I would definitely say this season. You know, some series can only hope. 
to be as good as a bad episode of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, I have to say, even the ones that I had issues with, or were kind of like, oh, like Robin Hood. If you go back to like what the lesson that they were, I like the lesson that they were trying to teach. It's like, you know, why are you, yeah, why are you doubting that something could be impossible? And it, there was enough of those in those episodes that I'm kind of hoping that's what they're going for with the Danny Pink thing. It's like, yeah. why would you think anything's impossible? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. but. That did kind of feel like, if it had cheaper sets, that would kind of feel like the old series. Well, the interesting thing is you say, oh, I know a lot of Americans don't like the Robin Hood episode. I was a little on the fence with it. It had its moments I like. But for over in England, they loved it because it was a good old-fashioned farce, mm -hmm. like the old, old, uh, the plays. And I mean, not my cup of tea. Yeah. I had I had a lot of issues with the episode, yeah. but I also enjoyed parts of it. Yeah, well, I enjoyed parts of it, but I think my, my issue with it wasn't so much the feel of it. Was That was one of those ones particularly where it felt like they were writing for the wrong actor. Well, yeah. Yeah. again, this was Gatiss writing the episode, because really? he writes a lot of the past okay. episodes, and just like Victory of the Dialects, which was the World War II one, uh, the for series five, mm -hmm. that was actually intended to be for Tennant. Yeah. Uh, and I feel Smith played the part more like Tennant because that's where they had it. Right. I definitely did. I think I, I said on the episode when we reviewed it, I felt like Robin, that Robin Hood episode was a Smith episode that yeah. gave And, and that was kind of what I had wondered was it was just something that was left over and they were like, well, we're going to use it because it's a good enough story. We can make it. Him. It's a Gatiss episode. Yeah. 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 So things we know about series nine, just because I like writing down these things, is also get your opinion. We're getting two companions next season. We know one is going to be Clara, because they've already said she signed, um, and we're going to get a second companion. We don't know who it is, what it is, or. Uh, I'm voting for not a modern London. Yes, yeah, that's what we're saying. We have somebody that's either from another. I was so excited. I think I told you that when she first came yes. out, it was like Victorian era. Awesome. At least it's going to be different. Even she's from Earth, and I was like, oh no, really? Yeah, yeah no. Um, that's what a lot of people hope. Alien, like alien or out of place different, person. Different, out of place, something. Um, and we know that they've started filming uh, the series two block of the show, so um, we might be getting a mini episode for Easter. We don't know for sure yet. Um, but yeah, no, it's. Um, I, I think we've hit all the other other things in the last episode where we talked about different things that were going to happen this season. Um, oh, and we don't know yet, but we do know Big Finish um, did pick up the rights to uh, do modern day unit stories, so they're one close, step closer to doing new stuff. So who knows? We might get more Osgood. We don't know yet who they're going to be. We do know that the actress that played Kate Stewart's going to come back. Um, or maybe Diagon Osgood. Maybe that oh. one's Diagon Osgood. Yeah, that's the other thing, is a lot of people huh. forget there are two Osgood, there were two Osgoods running around. Yeah, that's right. We might have just lost one of the two. So it'd be very easy to bring Osgood back. Mon let, like let, let himself an out. You know, but that would explain how she was so easily so fooled yeah. and, and fell for something so stupid of being like, I oh, well, that I was the Zygon. Yeah, that was the Zygon. She's not as smart, you know. Okay. Yeah, that way. Actually, I think it would be really interesting to have a companion who was a Zygon. Um, and, and, and go on for a while and, and not let also the doctor know yeah. that it was a Zygon. Well, for a while. technically, that happened with the horse that lived in the TARDIS. The horse and the girl in the fireplace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they turned out to be a Zygon. Yeah, where they were like, you can't have a horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like, yeah. It's yeah. a Zygon. Yeah, nice. But of course, the doctor didn't know that. But, you know, I mean, something. But what would you guys like to see on Series 8? I mean, not Series 8, Series 9. <laughs> I was like, Series 8? No. Yeah, no, 9. What would you guys like to see on Series 9? Because my wish is always, can we have a companion that's not from the 21st century Earth? So that would be on the top of the wish list. Um, it's can, we, can we have a companion who is like not middle class, boring white person? Like, could, could we have some, yeah. some diversity in the show, maybe? Well, see, that would be well, nice. Well, technically, Clara was yeah. diversity yeah. for them. Huh? Clara was diversity okay. for them, yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying, like, I think both Martha and Mickey got such short shift. Yeah, because Martha had the really hard coming in after, but, yeah. and then Mickey, who, that poor actor, because it doesn't matter what I see him in, from now on I always go, oh, it's Mickey the Idiot! Mickey the Idiot, yeah, yeah, just the fact that we call him Mickey the Idiot, I mean, like, it, it, some, some diversity, could we have an Asian companion? Mm -hmm. Um, well, we did for the one episode. 
a TV movie. Okay, but it's gotta be. Right, 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 right. We, we need, need to, to, we we need need to have more. more token. Right, right. <laughs> Let's have some diversity and some genuine diversity, not like token diversity. Um, and <laughs> let's do something that isn't intrinsically tied into Earth and the human race. Like, I get it. We want to feel like we're important. We want to feel like we're special. But we have the whole of space and time. We have some more It's cheaper to do the sets on Earth. Words. But, but yeah, because if you ended up with an alien companion best. and it got tied back to something that was happening in another culture out in space, yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah. So what would be interesting is we, we know that they sort of try to carbon, carbon copy this season a lot of ways to Pertwee episodes, that they're Doctor stuff. So I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen next. Because I because I say this is that you know gonna play a recorder. No, that would have been beforehand. No, um <laughs> but I don't know. because I, I, here's the thing is what a lot of people don't realize, um actually come the twenty I believe the twenty sixth of this month, we're talking the ten year anniversary of New Who. They keep saying they're not gonna do anything for it because they just did the fiftieth but I'm 50th. sorry. A lot of people that big that I don't do but something. here's the thing is that for some people they only know New Who. Mm -hmm. You have to do something of a yeah. celebration to that. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, this would be a third time to bring Jack back, um, to bring um, uh, River back, to bring any of those yes. those fan favorite companions from this era, mm -hmm. from, from this past decade. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, It's I, I want them to do something. I mean, it's not to be as grand. It could be one episode where we get to see, you know, have an adventure with with one of the the, the new companions, mm -hmm. and also I, I would say I'd, like I'd love to see a classic companion come back. Let's see more of life after the TARDIS, because that was the big rumor of this past season that we would get either uh, Joe Grant back because of the Third Doctor connection, or even um, Tegan from the Fifth Doctor, because mm -hmm. we know that she visited, she visited the set. They they took photos of her and Capaldi in the in the sort of companion Third Doctor pose. Um. What about bringing back Jenny? I know she was okay. yeah, Doctor's daughter. Well, 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 one thing we do know is that uh, Moffat is the reason why she's still alive. Mm -hmm. Davies wanted to kill her and keep her dead. Um, Moffat wanted it back, but we know that because she ended up marrying Tennant, they ended up having a kid, she ended up producing some stuff and starting some plays, it just doesn't be conducive for her to come back. Yeah, but but Moffat. Like exactly. Anniversary kind of thing. Yeah. What happened? What yeah. happened to Jenny? Yeah. Well, and what, well, while we're dealing with the what happens, given that we saw River's story in River and we've seen the ending, I would like to see the we beginning. We haven't seen the ending. Okay, but I would like to see, you know, she. they talked about all these great adventures and her constant response to him was when you're older and you got the idea that her doctor was much older and I felt like... Alex Kingston and Peter Capaldi would have freaking phenomenal chemistry together, and it would be really neat to see some of her yeah. some of her backstory. Okay. okay, that is it for us. Uh, until next time, this is GPR signing off. Peace Bye. from Nomcon 2015.